Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh And a very good day ladies and gentlemen Kepada hadirin yang dihormati Rakan-rakan media dan para penonton Yang sedang menyaksikan sesi ini Melalui platform maya Minggu Sains Negara 2021.com.my Dan laman Facebook Mosti Saya Rahmat Shazi dari Shaz Innovation Dan saya akan menjadi MC anda untuk hari ini Ladies and gentlemen, especially to the younger audiences Our invisible enemy, COVID-19, is changing our lives radically around the world. It is hard to fight this invisible enemy, but it will be harder to win this battle without the right weapons. The weapons here refer to the knowledge, skills, and solutions in science, technology, and innovation. Today, we will discuss about the development of these capabilities. It is indeed our pleasure to have an illustrious group of panelists with us today, together with the Minister of Science, Technology and Innovation himself, YB Khairi Jamaluddin, who will be the moderator and discuss with us on vaccine development in Malaysia. Uh, Assalamualaikum and a very good day, YB. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you very much. Lovely, lovely. Alhamdulillah. And uh, I'm guessing that the panelists, we can see that they are actually raring to go. So together with YB Khairi, we have another two panelists representing the research team. It's none other than Professor Datin Paduka, Dr. Teo Su Huang, the Chief Science Officer of Cancer Research Malaysia, the nation's first independent cancer research non-profit organization. And it's fully funded, managed and staffed by Malaysians focusing specifically on research of cancers that are prevalent in Malaysia. Now, Prof. Datin Paduka is the principal investigator of the Malaysian Breast Cancer Genetic Study, the Malaysian Ovarian Cancer Genetic Study, and the Malaysian Mammographic Density Studies. Representing the manufacturing arm is Dr. Badarul Hisham Abdul Rahman, Head of Research and Development at Farmaniaga, where he oversees, among others, process scale-up and establishment of new manufacturing facilities. His area of expertise is in the field of biochemical engineering and biotechnology. He has served as an adjunct professor at Chemical Engineering Department of UPM and is also a member for the Board of Academic Advisory, Faculty of Engineering, UKM. Now, to the audience, I know that you are all excited and can't wait for the discussion to start. So let us not waste any more time and kickstart the program by inviting our Minister of Science, Technology and Innovation, YB Khairi Jamaluddin, to take center stage and moderate the discussion. Now, over to you, YB. Thank you very much. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan uh, salam sejahtera. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome uh, our audience uh, following us uh, on all the social media platforms. Um, and also to welcome Professor Datin Paduka, Dr. Teo, who is the Chief Science Officer of Cancer Research Malaysia, as well as uh, Dr. Babu Hisham Abdurrahman, Head of Research and Development at our local uh, pharmaceutical uh, bioscience company, Pharma Niaga. Um, it's very exciting today because uh, I get to moderate uh, two specialists, and we have a couple of hundred, uh, especially young scientists and, and young budding scientists listening uh, to this conversation. Um, the topic for discussion today is vaccines and vaccine development. And this is a topical subject because of the COVID-19 vaccination process that is being uh, underway, not just in Malaysia, but all over the world. I think hundreds and millions of doses have already been uh, administered. And this has seemed to be one of the uh, most important ways to end the pandemic or at least get the pandemic under control. Uh, so the issue of uh, vaccines uh, caught a lot of trepidation, a lot of concerns, uh, even a lot of concerns and fears because of the misinformation out there. Uh, but actually vaccinations are, are not something new to us. Most people, uh, when uh, they are born, go through a series or set of vaccines uh, that protect them from um, uh, diseases which uh, today you don't find anymore in, in Malaysia. So you have your measles, rubella, polio, uh, and of course, for Muslims who want to go for their Hajj or their Umrah, they take the meningococcal meningitis uh, vaccination. Uh, so in fact, it's, it's nothing new. Uh, I always tell people what is the easiest way to explain uh, vaccines. 
uh, vaccines teach your body how to fight a virus, basically. It primes your body uh, in, in fighting a virus. Um, there are many new technologies, the platforms used for, for vaccination. The traditional ways to put an inactivated virus inside of you that primes the uh, immune system to produce antibodies. Uh, but of course, now we are in a whole new world of uh, vaccine technology with the mRNA vaccine, with the DNA vaccine that Professor Teo will touch on a bit later. Uh, and these are great developments because with this kind of uh, smarter vaccines that are in play, uh, it, it opens a whole new world of possibilities uh, in treating uh, various different um, diseases uh, and also uh, conditions. One thing that I wanted to start off with is that um, when this pandemic started, uh, we realized something uh, that was uh, of great concern, which is that in Malaysia, we do not have end-to-end -end capacity and capability to develop vaccines. That's why for the COVID-19 vaccines, we've had to buy from uh, manufacturers abroad. Uh, all the vaccines that will be used for our immunization program had to be bought uh, from uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, abroad. What we've done is, uh, we've tried to use this opportunity to create value in the country. So, for instance, um, when I negotiated the contract with Sinovac, I said, why don't you work together with uh, a, a local pharmaceutical company? And they teamed up with Pharma Niaga, and Pharma Niaga will be doing the fill finish uh, part of the vaccination manufacture, uh, vaccine manufacturing. Essentially, fill finish is to put the, the liquid into the vial. And we'll be doing that right here in Malaysia. And that's a, that's a fantastic development. And hopefully, Farmanyaga will use this investment uh, into looking at uh, more end-to-end -end manufacturing uh, for the vaccines. And this is important because um, I've been told by the experts, my advisors and scientists, that this will probably not be the last pandemic or epidemic. There are so many other zoonotical viruses that are out there that can possibly jump into humans, and we will continue to have to uh, develop vaccines for all sorts of viruses in the future. And that's why uh, my ministry is currently preparing a vaccine roadmap where uh, I want to challenge the science community in Malaysia. Within five to 10 years, we have vaccine development capability in Malaysia from research, preclinical trials, from research all the way to preclinical uh, pre research to clinical trials, right up to manufacturing right here in Malaysia. Now, let's get started with, uh, with the panel because uh, we want to hear from the experts themselves. So, Professor Ratin Paduka, Dr. Teo, leads Cancer Research Malaysia, and this is a world-class uh, research facility right here in Malaysia, and uh, they are developing uh, the first cancer vaccine, if I'm not mistaken, for oral cancer. Uh, now, uh, uh, Professor, conventionally it, uh, conventionally, it takes a long time to research, develop, test, and introduce a new vaccine. Um, maybe we address the COVID vaccines first, and then we uh, go into the vaccine that you are developing. Uh, a lot of people are saying they're scared of taking the COVID vaccine because it was developed in less than a year. Can you tell us how the COVID vaccines were developed in less than a year, uh, when normally it takes decades to develop vaccines? Over to you, Professor. Thank you, YB, and thank you for very much for inviting me to this panel. As, you know, science is progressing all the time. So the first vaccines which were produced and uh, required us to isolate a virus and then use an inactivated form of the virus to inoculate individuals. And obviously when you're using a dead form of a virus, you are very concerned about side effects that you need to take a longer time to be able to evaluate it. But all of the newer technology no longer uses the full molecule of the virus to be able to make a vaccine. Now what we're actually doing is not even using bits of a protein from a virus to be able to make a vaccine. We just use the coding sequence in a, in a sense, the instruction book of how to make proteins. We're just using the instruction book in the form of a DNA or an mRNA sequence and injecting that into a human being to be able to generate the immune response. So, so long, if you like, the building blocks of that vaccine will therefore be, if you know the sequence of the thing that you want to make a, a immune response against, you can now just generate that sequence into a DNA molecule or into an mRNA molecule, and that gives you a formulation that can be injected. So the first reason why we're much faster now 
is because we are not using the full viral molecule that we need to isolate. We are now using bits of protein that we can put into DNA sequences and mRNA sequences. The second reason is because this is such a major global concern that affects every individual. All 8 billion people who live on the planet Earth are affected by this disease. It was very important to be able to do things um, in a, in, rather than doing it sequentially like this. That means you do one study and then you do the next and then you do the next. What was agreed by all of the regulatory authorities would be that you would do them in an overlapping fashion. So some of the animal studies, before they were concluded, the uh, human studies already started. Some of the first human studies which were started before they were concluded, the next phase of the human studies have already started. So usually the main reason why this is not conducted is because of money. So the reason why people don't do things in this way is because they, they anticipate that what happens if the first phase fails, they want to kind of make sure that it's safe before they go to the next phase. They don't want to invest that money first. But for a disease like COVID, where, which affects the whole world, what we want to do is speed is more important and therefore, we want to you know, be able to make sure that you're able to expedite the safety testing for all of this before you are able to, and then therefore cost was less of a concern because you already have a ready market. And I think ultimately in science, it's not just about discoveries, it's about safety and it's about financing. And because of these three considerations, the importance of the disease, the importance of safety for, for human beings, and the importance of getting this to market quickly, it was deemed necessary by the regulatory authorities to have an expedited way of ensuring safety. But is what, what is really important to mention is that all of the safety studies have shown that there is very little side effects with associated with any of the main formulations that have been approved. And the public should not be worried about safety of these vaccines because neither the formulation is new nor the uh, no, the technology is new. A lot of it has already been used for other diseases. Thank you, Professor. Um, maybe I'll uh, move on to Dr. Bandesha, but I'll come back later to uh, this exciting platform using mRNA and DNA later in the second segment to Professor. Uh, so, Dr. Bandesha, uh, from your perspective, uh, as, as, as a head of research and development for a pharmaceutical company, um, how, uh, how, has, how have pharmaceutical companies been able to scale up uh, from doing the research right up to manufacturing to the extent that some companies are churning out billions of doses this year? I understand Pharmaniaga will be supplying us, Malaysia, with uh, at least 2 million doses of the Sinovac vaccine every month. And this is, this is fantastic. So how, how has this um, accelerated so fast? Okay, uh, Assalamualaikum. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much uh, for inviting Farmanega YB. Um, okay, um, you mentioned about Farmanega is now the very first uh, Malaysian manufacturer who are now able to make human vaccine locally. Even though that we are now just working on the fully finished part, but this is a very important uh, uh, step whereby we develop the capability. You are fully aware that in, in this region, Malaysia is actually behind in this capability. Uh, we talk about not just the talents, but also the, uh, the facility. Now that with the help of Malaysian government uh, from Manega able to spearhead the, uh, be part of the Malaysian uh, vaccination program uh, in partnership with uh, Sinovac China, together with uh, other players like you know, uh, Pfizer and also AstraZeneca and a few other players. Uh, for Monaga, will be many, making a few million doses of vaccine per month. Yeah? So this is very exciting. Thank you to the government and personally to YBKG for spearheading the entire initiative. Um, like uh, in manufacturing any pharmaceutical product, this is very stringent, uh, uh, stringent uh, aspect of, of manufacturing. Uh, it has to be registered with the Ministry of Health uh, under uh, NPRA, whereby three quality attributes has to be shown. The quality of the product, the efficacy and safety of, of the product. The three elements, three quality attributes, safety, quality and efficacy. So a lot of, a lot of uh, company or ideas before uh, any product could be registered and even uh, before can be manufactured, they must show proof that 
three elements is proven, like the safety aspect of it, the quality aspect of it, the efficacy of which we've been talking about for the past many, many months uh, related to COVID-19. Uh, uh, but in the existence of Formanega that now we are uh, a players, industrial players in vaccine manufacturing, we can uh, start working with uh, research institutes, universities who have uh, great ideas in coming up with a new, new product. Uh, we can take it into uh, into a scaling up, into a designing a facility, and how to eventually uh, manufacture enough uh, clinical material for the clinical trial. Yeah, and then uh, we welcome any university and institute who have a great idea to work with Farmanega from the beginning, uh, because we look into not just the uh, uh, ideas, but also the economics and and technical aspect also has to be. Uh, complying to the regu regulatory requirement. So that is our role. So uh, not only that we put partner with local players uh, with great ideas, but we can also start making uh, clinical material and eventually to uh, mass produce it for commercialization, inshallah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nagesham. Uh, I'm going to come back to the point that uh, Professor Teo was uh, mentioning just now, which is the, these new platforms that have been used for vaccine development, these uh, genetic platforms, so your mRNA and your DNA vaccine. So uh, for people who are not familiar, the vaccine that we use here in Malaysia for our national immunization program, Pfizer, it's an mRNA vaccine. And so is the Moderna vaccine, which is used in other parts of the world. Uh, and as uh, Professor Teo mentioned earlier, essentially uh, you send the instructions on how to create a, a particular protein to the body uh, through the mRNA. So the mRNA goes in with the instruction book. Uh, and the mRNA disappears after a while. I'm told that it just disintegrates. So it's just like a, a, a Snapchat message that goes in and then it disappears after a while. And then the body has the instructions to create what is the, known as the spike protein. So on the lipid layer of the, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus are these uh, coronavirus, which is a crown, are these spike proteins. So it just produces the spike protein. Uh, for the immune uh, response to trigger the immune, immune response. The body recognizes the spike protein as the antigen and it produces antibodies uh, against that antigen. Is that right, Professor Teo, on a very layperson perspective? Absolutely. That was a wonderful, very relevant description of, the, of how we create antibodies. Absolutely right. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Guru Science check up. Okay, Lulus. Uh, now I, I'm going to get uh, I'm going to get to the point of this. The point of it is that uh, I'm told that uh, this particular platform is a game changer in science because you can send in any uh, form of genetic uh, uh, code for uh, the body to create a particular antigen for the to trigger an immune response. So tell us, uh, Professor Teo. Uh, because you're developing a DNA vaccine, which uh, which is uh, similar to the RNA vaccine in a sense that the genetic code is sent in. Where does this take us in terms of curing uh, cancer, curing uh, ailments that have been uh, with us for a long time? How, how significant is this in, in the world of science and medicine? Hugely significant, uh, YB, because the whole point is that we want to get faster and better. And ultimately what we want is therapies with, with that are affordable, with minimal side effects. But in vaccine development, there are two major challenges. The first challenge is how do you deliver the sequence so that the body knows what to vaccinate against. The second challenge is actually what do you target? What is the thing that you are targeting, right? So just now you mentioned that in the case of a coronavirus, you're, in, you're targeting that spike. The crown, the spike in the crown of the coronavirus is what you want to try and make an antibody against. And for something like a virus or a bacterium, because they're not part of this, that's a little bit more straightforward because they have bits of things that are not found in our normal cells. Our normal cells don't have that spike. But for cancer, which arises from our own body, from our own cells, it's a lot more difficult. How do you identify, uh, how do you get your immune system to hit a cancer cell that originated from a normal cell in your own human body, but not kill all the other cells that are normal, that really are there for a very essential functions within the human body? So in cancer research, the major challenge is not, not so much, the, not only the delivery, but also what can you use to replace the spike? What protein can you use to replace the spike? And there are many different approaches that have been used. So the reason why Cancer Research Malaysia has been successful is because we've been funded by the Ministry of Science for more than 15 years. 
to really identify what makes oral cancer cells different from normal cells, what makes nasopharyngeal cancer cells different from normal cells, so that we can identify the proteins that can form, that can replace the spike of coronavirus and make a target for antigens. And that's exactly what we have done. We identified two proteins. After searching for tens and tens of thousands of proteins, we identified two proteins, which we know that if we can deliver into the cell, uh, using something like an mRNA or a DNA vaccine, the cell will be able to generate an antibody response. And that antibody response wakes up the patient's immune system to be able to now fight cancer. And we all know that immunotherapy is the way forward. Previously, we only talked about three therapies for cancer. You either cut it out with surgery, or you zap it out with radiotherapy, or you poison it with chemotherapy. Now there is a fourth arm, and that is immunotherapy. So cancer vaccines is going to be one important strategy. Other important strategies include many other approaches that we can use to be able to boost the patient's immune system to fight cancers more effectively. Now, Professor Teo, uh, that's really, really exciting. And I think the, the audience um, who are following science as, as young uh, budding scientists, uh, they, they want to know, when will uh, Cancer Research Malaysia's uh, cancer vaccine get to the market? Uh, will it be as fast as the COVID vaccines? What are the processes that you have to go through in order for this uh, vaccine to be used and approved uh, by the regulatory authorities? Unfortunately, I wish it was yesterday because there are so many patients that are dying of the disease. But the harsh reality is that there are two reasons why this is going to be slower for our cancer vaccine. Number one, it's going to affect less individuals. So even though oral cancer affects, uh, head and neck cancers affect close to three quarters of a million people every year, it's not the eight billion people that are uh, potentially affected by the COVID virus. That's number one. Number two, it's all about money. Ultimately, because your market is so big, your cost of you know, taking things forward is, is much less because you have more opportunities to recoup the R&D funding. But when you're dealing with a disease like what we deal with that is more common in our part of the world, that results in poor survival but affects mostly poor people, then there isn't enough money in it to do this type of work, which is why the work that's done in Malaysia is so important because we ensure that Asian patients are not left out in the fight against cancer. And we need more Malaysians to become scientists, to advocate for science, to be able to change the landscape for science in the same way as you are doing, YB. Because ultimately, it's about changing, um, creating new solutions for the future that will build the basis for our economy, that will enable us to be able to grow out of a middle-income country into a high-income country. Thank you, Professor. Um, coming to you, Dr. Badresham, uh, you know there's all this talk about this uh, DNA, mRNA vaccines, uh, which require a much more complex manufacturing uh, uh, capability. Um, from what I understand, the Sinovac vaccine that you are filled and finishing in your Puchong plant is an inactivated uh, virus uh, vaccine, which is more traditional. Uh, so it's uh, less uh, difficult to, to develop. How far away is uh, Malaysia and our pharmaceutical uh, sector from being able to do mRNA cutting edge uh, vaccine manufacturing? Okay, you already uh, uh, mentioned it, uh, YB, that we have just started. We, we're just about to acquire technology for traditional uh, vaccine manufacturing. But when it comes to a new technology, our philosophy is to make uh, affordable and uh, patient have access to the product. We have to, we have to uh, evolve eventually. Uh, for yes, mRNA types of vaccine, there are a lot of uh, advantages related to uh, the cost, related to the speed, to the market, and so on. But um, if we were to look back at the technology, it's, it's not new. Uh, the uh, nano, lipid nanoparticle was first uh, published in 1976. Uh, it took a long while before a full development and characterization before it can be used for, for vaccine. Even the material was actually approved by FDA to be used in 2018, quite recent. 
Uh, we still have quite a, some time for, for Malaysian scientists and industrialists to start working uh, uh, to establish our own technology. But like I said, eventually we also have to move with technology. We, we must invest. But having said that, uh, the uh, traditional uh, types of vaccine production is still quite relevant. Like I said, uh, we can foresee quite, uh, yes, in terms of cost, maybe slightly higher because we need to contain this uh, pathogen from releasing from the environment. It has to be cultured in certain uh, environmental control environment. But like I said, uh, we, move, we move with technology as, as and when we invest yeah? and when we are ready, especially when we have a partner, especially. So the follow-up question, the natural follow-up question to, to this is, is uh, Professor Tio is a couple of years away, maybe a few years away from, uh, from bringing this uh, from uh, preclinical research to clinical trials to actually manufacturing. Would Pharma Niaga, and I don't want to put you on the spot here, but be willing to invest uh, in, in uh, the manufacturing capacity for a locally developed, locally researched vaccine um, and which uses DNA uh, to bring it to market? This is very exciting, YB. Um, if we were to look at the manufacturing process, there are two parts. One part is to make the mRNA where we, we uh, conjugate it into a target molecule for drug delivery, for the vaccine delivery. The other part is the packaging, like what we are actually doing now, which is fill and finish. Uh, I would imagine making uh, mRNA-based vaccine for fill and finish may not be that much different from what we're actually doing now. It's just that we may have to invest or partner with the upstream part where they, they actually amplify the mRNA and have it in, uh, formulated into nanoparticle. By having uh, this opportunity, say, to work with a Cancer Research Institute, uh, it's very exciting. To, we, we look into that opportunity. Yes, definitely. Uh, if I can butt in, YB. Yes, of course. It's going to be really exciting because we have fit, just finished uh, or just about to wrap up the final animal studies, the preclinical studies, and we're putting a package together to go to the regulatory authorities. So if everything goes well, we should go into phase one clinical trials by the end of this year. This is going to be the first therapy that was developed right here in Malaysia, funded by the Ministry of Science and funded by do uh, charitable donations to Cancer Research Malaysia for Asian oral cancer patients that will go into human clinical trials. I think it's a really landmark and important for us, you know, not to just miss the opportunity to ensure that we can bring the pharmaceutical industry in Malaysia with us. Because ultimately our objective is to do two things, not just to cure cancer patients, but to ensure that we are able to do so and bring up the economy of Malaysia because it's building the economy, economic base that will create more jobs and hopefully create a vibrant environment for the future of Malaysia. This is, uh, on days like this, I, I love my job. We're talking about curing cancer, nothing less than that. So hopefully uh, we can get the research and we can get the pharmaceutical industry together. We'll take this offline and, and we'll try and see what the roadmap is for uh, your vaccines for oral cancer. Exciting stuff. I'm going to come back to um, bring the discussion back to uh, this worry that people are having about uh, about vaccines and uh, I think Professor alluded earlier to the fact that uh, the research data shows that these vaccines are safe. Um, maybe I'll start with Dr. Badwisham. What are the, some of the rumors and misinformation? What is the most common uh, question you are getting as the research and development head of Pharma Niagara? I'm sure your friends, your family are asking you all sorts of questions. What is the most ridiculous thing you've heard? Thank you, Wabi. Uh, yeah, misconception about vaccines, especially under uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Everybody is actually affected by this pandemic and everybody's worrying about uh, when is their time to get the uh, vaccination. Uh, the most uh, worrying aspect, I would say, would be the side effect, yeah? Um, because the current uh, social media uh, era, everybody getting all kinds of information. It could be correct, it could be misleading, it could be like, uh, nasty and, and the challenge is a uh, general public they tend to believe every single thing every single information they have read so that is the danger uh, so but I think uh, government will be doing their part to uh, keep uh, educating the public like for Manega, we also are telling the public or through uh, through the uh, social media and also through a series of webinar but more importantly is to share the truth, yeah? the truth, the technology, the side effect, 
And also, most importantly now that uh, most of the vaccines started being uh, rolled out uh, in, uh, globally and even in Malaysia. And I really have to thank uh, Wabi KJ yourself personally for taking Sunbet vaccine as the first person in Malaysia. That really changed a lot of perception about having uh, a second-hand or a substandard and, and less quality vaccine, uh, of which that is not true, simply because of the social media information, uh, the information on the efficacy and safety uh, were misled. Uh, people, uh, general layman, do not really understand how to interpret that, that information. Uh, so I believe now that we have started the rollout, like we at Farmanega, we started working with the KKM uh, through the vaccination training program and also started sharing the uh, pharmacovigilance data globally from, from uh, what we have access to, especially from Sinovac, yeah? Uh, telling the public that is actually safe. Uh, some other ridiculous uh, misperception, something that we can't really, uh, uh, talk much, maybe they were talking about having a chip in the vaccine so that they can track you and things like that, extra information. I think that one is rather ridiculous, but the rest I think we can address by educating the public and keep on uh, educating them. Thank you, uh, Dr. Babesham. Uh, Professor Teo, um, one important part of public health management is risk communication uh, in a sense that um, any uh, medical intervention brings with it risks. Uh, so there's this big uh, conversation right now, uh, be it at an expert level or even at the layperson level, uh, about the risk and benefit of receiving the vaccination. So this is what, um, uh, on, a, on an individual level, uh, when we counsel people uh, or was it, when there's consultation, uh, we figure out whether the benefits of vaccination outweigh the risks. And this is done especially for people with certain contra contraindications and things like that. Can you explain to the lay audience what, what does that mean? What, what does it mean when you balance risk and benefit of vaccinations? I think even before we talk about that, YB, we need to talk about the difference between association and causation. What association means is that, you know, if I'm baking a cake, for example, and it's raining outside, just because there's a thunderstorm and my cake didn't turn out, doesn't mean that the thunderstorm made me a bad cook. It just was an association. You know, every time I bake tends to be in the afternoon and in the afternoon tends to be a thunderstorm. So that's an association. The thunderstorm didn't cause me to be a bad cook. Causation, on the other hand, is when if I stand out and I hold a lightning rod and obviously I get electrocuted, then it's a causation because I held the rod that attracted the, the lightning and I got electrocuted. It's a causation, right? And the, the challenge with the vaccine at the moment is when you are vaccinating so many individuals, in those individuals, as a chance, those things will happen. So in other words, whether they had the vaccine or not, that would that event would have happened anyway. So at any certain rate, you know, when you take 10,000 people, one of them or a few of them are going to have a heart attack at any one day. On the other hand, if you take a few hundred thousand individuals, a few of them are going to get a blood clot every day. So there is no strong uh, causation between a vaccine and getting the blood clot. And this is why the clinical research is really important. And this is why regulators are very particular about side effects being reported so that they can understand what is causation, what is actually associated with the virus itself, the vaccine itself. And I think from the evidence that I've seen so far, the, the risk of the vaccines or any of the vaccines are really relatively low. There's no known major side effect of the vaccines that really warrants us to be very extremely careful about this. But what are the benefits? Well, the benefits are that the reality is that we cannot continue staying at home. The economy is suffering, our mental health is suffering, our progress is suffering. There's so many aspects of life per normal that is suffering as a consequence. So when we think about the benefits of vaccination, it's not just the benefits of protecting ourselves as individuals, but also protecting the individuals around us. You know, one of the beautiful things about Asian families is we have, we're very close to our extended families. You know, when we are very used to having open houses, we're very used to being having uh, social gatherings and so on. So to be able to protect those that we love, we need to have the vaccine. And finally, to pr protect 
the wider society, the longer we take to get vaccinated as a society, the longer Malaysia is going to go on the path of recovery economically. And I think that's really important to put out there, that in a sense, it's about duty or responsibility, not just to ourselves, but also to our family members, our community and the wider country at large to really take on the vaccine because the sooner that we can get through this as a country, the sooner Malaysia can climb out of this hole. Uh, Professor, thank you for the, the explanation on causality. I think that's, uh, that was very clear and something that a lot of people, and including the media, don't understand. So when there's an adverse event, they will report it as though the vaccine had uh, resulted or create, caused the, the adverse event. Uh, but just as somebody who's involved in clinical research, uh, I wanted to get your idea about whether or not this is something that we should worry about. If we look at the latest uh, AEFI, AEFI reporting or the adverse events following immunization reporting since we started giving the COVID-19 vaccines here in Malaysia, and this is based on self-reporting through the MySajatra application, um, we have uh, so far received 3,676 reporting uh, of, uh, of um, uh, a re a regular, the most regular occurring uh, adverse events, including uh, pyrexia, fever, injection site pain, uh, muscle soreness, headache, dizziness, nausea, chills and fatigue. So that amounts to about 0.52% per 100,000 dose. Is that a lot? No, absolutely not. Absolutely yeah. not. And, and I think when we think about reporting the side effects, you know, uh, YD, you reported one very important statistic, which is how common does it occur? But I think the second important statistic is how serious is it? How serious are these side effects, right? Not just how common they are, but also how serious they are. And really, it's also about whether we can live with these side effects or not. You know, how long does it last? Is it something that is going to last forever? Or is it going to last a few days and then you're done with it? Most of the time, fevers, injection sites, and so on are really temporary. They last a few hours or at most a couple of days, and then that will be it. So the reality is we only look out for the more serious side effects. And those are much, much more rare than the 0.5% per 100,000 that you mentioned. It's really um, incredibly rare to have those more serious side effects. I think what's important to point out is that those more serious side effects are also things that we can deal with. So if you're causing harm by causing side effects that nobody can deal with, then I think we will all be extremely concerned. But ultimately, we mustn't forget that the job of a doctor is not to cure more lives. I'm not sure that this will come as a surprise to you. The job of a doctor is not to cure more lives but to do no harm, okay? So the, the, the doctor's oath is, number one, do no harm. And beyond that, only go and save more lives, right? So it's really important in that context to be able to say that, you know, what we are trying to do here is through the vaccine strategy, be able to save more lives, but first by doing no harm. And what you can demonstrate from the 3,600 cases that have been reported, is that the side effects are really relatively mild. Uh, Dr. Badrisham, uh, I was talking, uh, I had, the, as you said, Sinovac um, uh, vaccination the other day. I'm having my second dose on Thursday. I've been talking to frontliners who've had uh, their two doses of Pfizer, and some of them told me that uh, after the second dose, they feel a little bit more uh, worse for wear. Um, and uh, so I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a non-medical person. I mean, I'm not a doctor. So somebody said to me that um, actually having a bit of a side effect is a good sign because it shows that your body is responding to the vaccine. Is, is that true? Uh, yeah, for some reason, uh, people tend to think that way, meaning that whatever antigen that was uh, actually uh, made in the cells uh, provoking the body to uh, react because you were prone, uh, you were like primed to it the first time around. But uh, data from, uh, maybe that works for mRNA-based vaccine, but data from Sinovac uh, is actually otherwise. The higher number of dose, uh, the body react less to it as if like you've been uh, conditioned to it. Even during the clinical trial at Sinovac, even when they try for three different dose, uh, three dose uh, regime, uh, 
uh, the side effect is actually subsides, so it's less. So uh, maybe it depends on different types of vaccine design, YB. I'll let you know what happens on Thursday. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be looking out for that. Thank you. Yeah, Professor, you want to add something? Uh, YB, sorry to interrupt, YB. A lot of it really depends on how long the agent that you're injected with stays there. In other words, it's about the stability of what you're using as a vaccine itself, right? Yeah. But the point to remember is, People think that, you know, the vaccine goes in and somehow it generates a new, something new that goes on. But actually, it doesn't work like that. So the immune system already has all of this diversity in the human body. And what you're actually doing is picking up the one that recognizes the spike of the COVID uh, molecule. And then now making more copies of that, that one cell out of the millions and millions of cells that already exist in the human body. You're trying to make a lot of copies of that. Oh. How that actually happens and how that amplifies is a different response when what is injected is a dead virus, which is in the case of the Sinovac vi vaccine, or a DNA va vaccine, or an mRNA vaccine, which in the case of Pfizer is an mRNA vaccine. So how long the molecule is there to, to hunt up this one special cell that can recognize the, spec, the spike, really depends on the, the, the process itself is different for, for, for different patients. Fascinating. I, I've, I've never heard that. that that's, that's really, really um, uh, interesting for me because I've been following this as, as a lay person and I've, I've not had it explained like that. Um, okay, guys, we're, we're uh, about um, 14 minutes off from the closing. Uh, I want to pivot a little bit to, um, to talking about uh, research and uh, the science sector. So, uh, Professor, uh, we have curious, uh, passionate uh, STEM uh, advocates listening to us. Uh, I, my, my, my question is, uh, what, are your, what is your message for, for them on, on uh, devoting their lives to, to STEM? Uh, is, it, is it a, a lucrative career? Is it worth it? Um, I mean, there's a lot of hard work here. You're, you're saving uh, lives, uh, literally. Uh, but what, what can they expect if they choose this as their life? Do you want the truth, the naked truth, why be, in terms of what's the life of a scientist and the... Yes, I mean, this is the point of Mingu Science together. <laughs> yeah. I think if, if, um, if money was not a consideration, absolutely do science, right? There's no better career than being a scientist because I don't know about you, but I've always been really curious and I've always wanted to really find, solve puzzles and find out things. And if you can do that and get paid for it, what better job can you have, right, in life? You're always challenging yourself to learn and to be able to help individuals, help other people out there. It's a fantastic career. But I do think that we must recognize going in that it's not an easy career. To be able to succeed in science, requires you to be able to look at a big picture. You know, I need to be able to talk not just about cancer, but also about genetics, about cancer control and so on, right? You need to be able to do big picture strategy, but you also need to be an expert in one very, very detailed area for the rest of your life, you know? And, and that requires a very diverse skill set that takes a lot of training and a lot of endurance to be able to get to. But I would say it's a fantastic career because as a scientist, you get to really change the world. The future of the world is in science. The reality is that we'll still be isolating a viral protein from a cow and injecting it into human beings if it's not for scientists. Because of scientists, we move from injecting a cow virus to get a vaccine, to making recombinant proteins and, and generating a vaccine, to today, mRNA and DNA vaccines and so on, right? So it's because of science that we have all of these advances. In cancer research, for example, you know, 40 years ago, one in four, only one in four cancer patients would survive 10 years. Today, it's double that number, two in four. And what's going to make it three in four or four in four or nine out of 10? It is scientists. The harsh reality is the change to change the world, we need more scientists. Doesn't matter whether it's in climate change, cancer control, vaccine development, all of it needs scientists. So join us. And I think YB, be a champion. Be a champion and an advocate for kids to become scientists in the future. Absolutely, Professor. I'm going to ask you a, 
a relatively controversial question, but how good are Malaysian scientists benchmarked against the top scientists around the world? How come we don't have a Nobel Prize winner? The Nobel Prize is, um, is a really important uh, benchmark, but the reality is the Nobel Prize is given out primarily to what we call basic science. So understanding the fundamental building blocks of science, which to be honest is not funded properly in any low income country, including Malaysia. Low income, low and middle income countries just simply do not have the luxury to fund the fundamental building, understanding the fundamental building blocks of uh, science. And this is done better in high income countries where they spend $5 billion every day or every year on, on research of any one field, $5 billion. That's the kind of funding that they have, right? So the reality is in low and middle income countries, we need something more practical. The science that we focus on is more about what science can we take forward that helps our people in the shorter term, that can be commercialized in the shorter term and so on. This type of more um, translational science really doesn't, isn't the stuff that can win the Nobel Prize. But having said that, we are changing lives all of the time. The reality is that Cancer Research Malaysia created the world's largest uh, genomic map of Asian breast cancers. This was done right here in Malaysia not in our neighboring country down south, but that right here in Malaysia. And that genomic map led to the discovery of new biomarkers that were taking into clinical trials, including using immunotherapy to potentially improve the survival for breast cancer patients. And all of this can be done right here in Malaysia. So the reality is that we must make sure that we give Malaysians enough credit for the work that we do. All too often, we look at Malaysians who have done, who have won an award in another country and we say, oh, why they're, they're, why la, they are not here in Malaysia? Well, we don't look at Malaysians who are doing this type of work in Malaysia and celebrating the success that they've been able to achieve. I have a fantastic team that keeps winning awards, international award, be it the Global Challenge Research Fund or L'Oreal Awards or uh, OBE from the Queen and so on. But many of these awards are testament to the fact that Malaysians can and Malaysians continue to do this day, day after day to make an impact in science. Thanks, uh, Professor. I'm going to ask a similar question to Dr. Badu Sham. So, um, you know, uh, when AstraZeneca, when I did the purchase of AstraZeneca vaccines, I was told that our AstraZeneca order for Malaysia and for Asia Pacific for that matter, uh, will be manufactured in a factory in Thailand. Sinovac has given a contract for a pharmaceutical company in Indonesia to manufacture end-to-end -end the Sinovac vaccine, not just fill finish. Uh, I'm told that uh, Vietnam is developing their own and manufacturing their own vaccine. Bangladesh has a manufacturing vaccine manufacturing capability. India is the pharmacy of the world with the Serum Institute and other companies leading the way in terms of pharmaceutical. Yet, we here in Malaysia are just doing the full finish right now. What's happened and what's the future? Okay, thank you. Very good question, uh, YB. Um, in fact, that we are now ready to go uh, bigger into a fill and finish. We can one day uh, be more like Vietnamese, or Thai or Indonesian to do the contract manufacturing. In fact, we are uh, gearing up for higher uh, uh, production capacity. We can take up some of these uh, vaccine, maybe from Gamalaya, from AstraZeneca, because the fill and finish aspect of it is very similar. Of course, we are now uh, started uh, working on the plan to move uh, upstream into the synthesis of the antigen. Yeah, uh, the moment that we have the facility, uh, the excess capacity, we definitely be able to do that. Just like any other countries, that we are moving in a big way into a vaccine manufacturing uh, country. Inshallah. Now, the last segment, uh, I want to focus on something that is quite close to my heart uh, in leading this immunization campaign. Um, a lot of people ask me uh, why are we still quite slow? And the answer is, of course, vaccine supplies are limited. Um, of course, we tried to diversify our portfolio. That's why we bought from uh, uh, Western pharmaceutical companies. We bought from Chinese pharmaceutical companies. Uh, and yet still supplies are limited because it's a limited, um, it's a limited commodity at the moment. 
Um, and that brings me to my anger with uh, company uh, with countries that have bought uh, excessive amounts of the vaccines. There are countries which have bought uh, enough COVID vaccines to cover their population five times over. Uh, and this is uh, this is vaccine inequity, uh, really glaring inequity uh, around the world. Now, Professor, I want your views about um, intellectual property. Uh, how do we share intellectual property, especially for things which are essentially public goods? Vaccines and therapeutics must be public goods. You must share the ingredient. You must share the secret sauce. So as somebody developing cancer vaccines, what are your views about sharing the secret sauce uh, uh, to, to the rest of the world? Unfortunately, YB, that's an ideal that um, will not be met in the short term. The reality is that the development cost, or at least the excuse that the pharmaceutical companies give, is that the development cost for any vaccine uh, results in them wanting to recoup that cost and therefore they need a patent period that enables that to, to happen, right? So in other words, if it costs me $2 billion to develop a cancer therapy, then I want to make sure that I can sell it exclusively for 20 years you know, in my patent protection time so that I can recoup my costs. If every year I sell $100 million, uh, $100 million worth of product, I, it takes a long time for me to be able to recoup that cost. But I, I think that excuse no longer holds water because the reality is that the negotiations, the price negotiations around drugs need to be taking place and very hard conversations need to take place in order to ensure that uh, drugs and medicines are available to save lives and not just make money for the pharmaceutical companies. We really need to look at it more seriously. And I think in that light, we must remember one incredible man and one incredible team. You know, YB, you asked earlier, why were we able to develop the vaccine so quickly? People forget that the reason why was because one man decided that he is going to release the, the sequence, the genome sequence of the COVID virus, right? By releasing this genome sequence of the COVID virus, it meant that within a couple of months, people could already manufacture the DNA and the RNA uh, mRNA vaccine to be tested in animals. Within a couple of weeks and months, that could be possible. Can you imagine if that didn't take place, how much delay would that have caused as a consequence? So clearly we need to work at science diplomacy. So scientists don't just need to do cutting edge science. Scientists also have a role to play in terms of making policy, in terms of making better policy and building bridges between countries and ensuring that we are able to work together to save um, a lot of diseases. I'm going to ask uh, the industry now the same tough question. Uh, you're a listed company, you have to look after your shareholder value. Uh, and yet in a lot of developments of drugs, pharmaceuticals, vaccines, in particular the COVID-19 vaccines, a lot of the initial, initial funding came from the public. If you look at some of the mRNA vaccines, Moderna, a lot of that funding came the National Institutes of Health in the US, and yet they're profiting off of it. How does industry, how do uh, companies that seek to maximize shareholder value assist in promoting these things as public goods? Okay, in the case, okay, for Manega, our motto is patient for patients. Uh, we are generic uh, manufacturer for drugs. Now we're moving into biopharmaceutical. Uh, especially for COVID-19, uh, we very much working with the government to have uh, public access to the vaccination program. Um, we never really uh, review, uh, view this uh, COVID-19 as the main uh, income uh, making uh, uh, opportunity. It's, it's never been that way from the beginning, especially for COVID vaccine. Um, but for some of the product, we have to balance. Uh, we, we have to generate a uh, uh, certain amount of return so that uh, we become a very healthy uh, company so that we can, uh, we can uh, invest in new technology, make a new drug. Uh, but being a generic pharma company, uh, our motto, like I said, patient for patient, we make sure that the public have access to high quality product. Uh, at affordable price. That is our, has always been our motto. I think this is very similar to any 
uh, developing countries manufacturer, like uh, YB mentioned about Serum Institute, or a few other companies from uh, Thailand, Vietnam, and, and Indonesia. They are not really a profit making company, but of course they have to make some profit so to stay afloat in terms of company so that they can reinvest. But more importantly is for the people. Thank you. And I can confirm that Farmaniaga is uh, supplying the Sinovac vaccine almost at cost to the government of Malaysia. So thank you very much for, for that uh, contribution. Um, well, we've come to the end of our one hour and it was a, a great uh, discussion. It was a great hour for me to spend uh, uh, out of my normal work schedule to support Mingu Science Negara. And uh, this is uh, a critical program run by the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation every year, the National Science Week, especially to inspire uh, the younger generation of Malaysia to take up science um, uh, for their careers. And as Professor Tio mentioned just now, uh, and I believe it not just because I'm the Minister of Science, uh, but I truly believe that the driving force of our economy going forward uh, will no longer be your cheap inputs of land and labor, but it will be science. Uh, and technology. So thank you very much to Professor Tio and Dr. Badri Sham for joining us in such a stimulating discussion. Thank you very much, YV. There you have it, there are the Kalian, the sharing session that was moderated by our, our own Minister of Science, Technology and Innovation, YV Khairi Jamaluddin. And we heard some key takeaways from our esteemed speakers, Prof. Datin Paduka, Dr. Tio Su Huang of Cancer Research Malaysia, as well as Dr. Badru Hisham of Farmer Niagara. So now, the idea is clear, especially those of you of the gen younger generation, we need you to work together to safeguard our future. Work together with teams like Prof. Datin Padukas in order to develop those new ideas, those new vaccine ideas, and work with Dr. Badarul's team to make sure that those vaccines get to end users. Pursuing careers in STEM will actually help us in this particular direction, in this endeavor so that you can help us ensure the sustainability and the resilience when we fight not just against COVID-19, yeah, but there will be other pandemics that lurk in the corner. So we need to be ready for that. So we wish you all the success in the future, especially in these STEM fields. Now, thank you for watching. Now, don't switch off yet because I have some great news. We have the quiz. Yeah, we have the quiz that is related to the uh, grand prize because the virtual STEM Olympiad, of which this webinar is a part of, yeah, this is one of the highlights of Mingu Science Negara 2021. So it consists of daily quizzes, and this is actually the grand finale, the cap of all those particular quizzes. So the last questions for today it will be that just will be based on the webinar that's just concluded, the vaccine development in Malaysia. And you know, those of you still watching this webinar, you can follow the link that will be on screen in a bit in order to take part in that particular quiz. Yeah. So there we go. On screen, you will have this QR code. Scan this particular QR code so that you can join or you can follow through the platform www.minggusciencenegara.com.my. Yeah. Follow the instructions and links in order to answer the quizzes which are based on not just this particular webinar, but the webinar that was actually showcased at 11 a.m. this morning, talking about the science behind space exploration. Grand prizes, ladies and gentlemen, Adi Adi Skalian, 1,000 ringgit in cash, and also STEM educational kits, drones, and what have you. So great opportunity to win great prizes. Don't miss these opportunities. The deadline for submission is 12 a.m. tonight. 12 a.m. tonight, so 7th of April, right, yeah? 12 a.m. tonight, so make sure to sign in, register, take part, and answer these quizzes. You can view this particular video later on to get those answers, as well as the video that is at, that was showcased at 11 a.m. this morning. You can find that information on STEM for All Makerspaces YouTube page. STEM for All Makerspaces Spaces YouTube page or on the Facebook page. So pertaining to that, guess what? If you take time, you will, you might miss out because we've had 5,000 people register. That's 5,000 other people gunning for that grand prize. So make sure that you are the 5,001st person or later on. Make sure you take part in this particular competition and 
But with that, ladies and gentlemen, that we come to the end of our particular webinar today. We would like to take this opportunity to thank Mosti for the trust that has been given to us in hosting this particular webinar. Thank you to Magic for the great studio that I, I, I wish that you can see this particular studio. It's great, it's spacious and what have you. And of course, to our other parties uh, that has worked tires, tirelessly to make sure that Mingu Sai Segara 2021 run smoothly and successfully. With that, Ade Ade, thank you so much for watching. I'm Rahmat Shazi of Shaz Innovation Solution, as well as Stanford All Makerspace, bidding you farewell. Assalamualaikum and see you soon.